amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Hey everyone, Pastor Bill Wicks here from the Sunfield and Greenwood United Methodist Churches with a devotional for Friday, October 2nd, 2020. Well, we've been working our way through the book of 3 John, and here we are at our last devotion. I told you it only take three. It's an extremely small book. And so what we've talked about is the idea of hospitality, of caring for our brothers and sisters in Christ, of the importance of encouragement, of encouraging others when they are living for the Lord. Today, it, the letter takes a turn. And it's a rather disastrous turn, really. So let's look then, starting in verse 9. 3 John 9. I have written something to the church, but Diotrophes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that. He refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. If you've been studying along with us through this uh, set of devotions, you know that this letter was written to a man by the name of Gaius. John commends him for his commitment to the truth of the Word of God, for his commitment to care for the stranger, for his commitment to honor the leadership of the church, namely John himself and John's emissaries, missionaries, and administrative folks who have come to try to deal with diatrophies. Diatrophies we learn of in verse 9 here. We also know that John has written a previous letter to the church, but it didn't go so well. Diatrophies didn't want it. Diatrophies, he says, likes to put himself first and does not acknowledge our authority. Now, it's really interesting to me that the name Diatrophes, it's a, it's a Greek name, and it means nurtured by Zeus. And so his name is a name that has to do with a false god, with Zeus. We're all familiar with Zeus. It's part of popular culture. Uh, it's one of the ancient Greek gods. Uh, I use that, the small G gods, because they really had no power, because they weren't real. But his name means nurtured by Zeus, so he already had to kind of a strike against him. That's why in some cultures, they actually change their name when they come to the Lord. They get rid of those names that deal with paganism and false teaching. But Diotrophes kept his name, and he's keeping the character of his former life as well. Think about this. He likes to put himself first. Now, I gotta ask you a question. I hope you know the answer to this. Are we supposed to be first? Well, I can't hear you answering, but I would assume that most of you said, no, we're not really supposed to be first. We like to be first. We like to be in charge. We like to get things our way, but we're not really supposed to be first. Who's supposed to be first? Well, of course, God is supposed to be first in our lives. He is the head of the church, Jesus Christ, and he's supposed to be first. But Diotrophes has taken the place of God in the congregation. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 1.18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Diotrophes wants to put himself first, but Christ is supposed to be first. And this is causing a tremendous amount of trouble within the church. Now, the second problem here, because he likes to put himself first, is the fact that he doesn't acknowledge the authority of the apostles. 
Remember we said most likely John's the only one left, but John obviously has co-workers that he has with him who possibly have taken the place of some of the early apostles. Maybe they're like a council of bishops because the apostles were appointed by Christ as heads over the church. Now remember, under his headship, his lordship, but they were in charge of the church. As one by one died off, they were replaced by bishops. And John, who is the last remaining apostle, most likely at this point, just calls himself the elder because he knows that he's pretty much the de facto head of the church now. He is the only remaining apostle. But he is serving as bishop over a number of churches and probably general oversight over the whole council of bishops that he has appointed or that have been put in place as the apostles died off. But Diotrophes does not recognize his authority. He wants to rule things by himself, and that is a big problem. I mean, think about this for a minute. Now, we're United Methodists, and so we are used to having a kind of hierarchical structure above us. I'm the pastor of two local congregations. I, I serve what is known as a charge within the United Methodist Church, which, of course, as you know, includes the Sunfield United Methodist Church, which is just outside of DeCoin, and the Greenwood Church, which is just out in the country of Mulkeytown. And these two churches come together as a charge, and I am the administrative officer of the church. I am the directing pastor. But I have someone over me. On the district level, I have my district superintendent, uh, Reverend Stan Irvin is my superintendent, and he's my direct supervisor. I'm an elder, he's an elder, but he holds a position of authority over me. Now, Stan is a great guy. He doesn't lord his authority over us. He just simply leads us and he fulfills his role as the superintendent. But over him is our bishop. Our bishop is an elder, just like I am, just like Stan is, but our bishop has been consecrated to a particular job of oversight and spiritual leadership over our annual conference. Now, our annual conference is from Highway 80 all the way back and forth across the state down to the very southern tip of the state. That's Bishop Frank Beard. He's our bishop, and he has authority over us. And then there is a council of bishops, and the council has a president, which rotates year by year. But as we think about this, we have a hierarchical structure. So did the early church. There is a misconception that the early church was congregational in nature, and each one was autonomous. They weren't. But Diotrophes wants it to be. <laughs> and that's the biggest problem he has going, at least here in verse 9. He thinks that because he is in that local church, it's his. Now, has he appointed himself the bishop over the area? I don't know. No one knows because it's not clear within the letter. Has he, is he the pastor of the church and he thinks that he should have absolute and ultimate authority and no one can tell him anything? I've run into some pastors that are like that. It's a dangerous thing. Pride comes before the fall, right? That's what the scripture tells us. Or is he a layperson in the church, and instead of giving proper authority to those who are over him in spiritual leadership that the Lord has placed there, he is the church bully. Churches have bullies. I don't know if you've ever experienced it. I've experienced it a number of times over the 28 years that I've ministered in local congregations as the pastor. I experienced it some in our home church before I entered the ministry. I experienced it some as a child in the church before I walked away from the church for a time. Churches have bullies, uh, folks who want to run the church absolutely on their own, no one else making any decisions, and their decision is final. It can be the pastor, or it can be a lay person in the church. It can even be someone who is just a, a now this is going to sound bad, I don't mean it that way, it, it could be someone who is a pew sitter. Now, what's a pew sitter? Somebody who refuses to get in any leadership. They just want to tell everybody in leadership how to do it. We don't know what Diotrophes is. Most likely, he is the pastor or the lay leader, to use our terminology, of the church. 
and he doesn't acknowledge the authority of the apostles or of the ruling body of the larger worldwide church. Doesn't acknowledge their authority. And so John says, so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing. John is planning a trip to the church. He's not sure when that'll be or if he's going to be able to pull it off. But when he comes, he's going to administer some church discipline. Now, when we talk about disciplines, United Methodists, we think about, you know, the, the book that has all of our rules and regulations in it. Uh, that is the discipline, yes. But church discipline means that somebody who is being rebellious against the Word of God, someone who's stirring up trouble in the church, is brought to the carpet for it. Obviously, John has sent his emissaries to try to get Diotrophes straightened out, and he's absolutely refused. So now he is writing to Gaius to let him know what's going on, so Gaius won't think that John just hasn't been giving any instruction or help. And to thank him for caring for those whom John has sent to this local congregation. But he is having some trouble here. He's away, he's not in this local congregation, but when he comes, he's going to administer church discipline. I'm not sure what that will look like. Will it be uh, what we might call excommunication? He's going to toss the man out of the church? Is it going to be that he just simply talks to him and tries to straighten him out? And if he'll straighten out, everything will be fine. He can continue in his leadership position. Is it that he's going to throw him out of leadership, still inviting him to be part of the church, but he's going to be gone. We're not sure, but he's going to bring up what he's doing. Talking wicked nonsense against us, he says, so he's making up things about the church leadership. I've run into that before, too, and not content with that. He's not content just to slander church leadership. He's going even farther than that. He, he refuses to welcome those who John sent, and on top of that, he tries to stop anyone in the church from showing kindness or hospitality to those who have come from Jerusalem or wherever John is at this time. Most likely he is at Ephesus. Those whom John has sent there, he refuses to welcome them. And if anybody objects, he puts them out of the church. He says, well, if you don't like it, there's the door, my way or the highway. Nobody has more authority over the church than I do. That's what Diotrophes is saying. And so John is trying to encourage Gaius and anyone who Gaius would share this letter with. Do not imitate evil. Don't start to act like Diotrophes. Repent. Let pride go. Bring in humble submission to God and the leadership that he's placed there before you. And then get going again. He says, because whatever does good is from God, whatever does evil is not from God or has not even seen God. And there are those within the church of the living God who have placed themselves above the Lord, above his law, above his morality, above everything, and said, but I'm going to do it my way. There is a need for discipline in the church today. There is a need for our Episcopal leadership to stand up and say, we're not going to put up with this anymore. In a previous video, one of our prayer services, I mentioned the trust clause, that we do have a specific doctrine, and the reason the trust clause is there is to make sure that the church, the local congregation, is preaching and teaching what we believe as United Methodists. But there's a lot of people who aren't teaching rightly. They are teaching absolutely contrary to the word. But they have not been called on the carpet yet. And our Episcopal leadership needs to call them on the carpet, just as John was going to call Diotrophes on the carpet for his bad behavior and for his insistence that he is in control and no one else. So what should you do if you have a church bully? What should you do if you have someone who refuses to acknowledge the word of God? Well, according to the scriptures, Jesus told us the first thing we're supposed to do is we are supposed to go to that person and talk to them. John has reached out to Diotrophes. He sent him a letter, but Diotrophes has rejected that letter. Now he sent his emissaries to talk to him, and Diotrophes has rejected them as well. So 
the church discipline that needs to happen here is, since he is not repentant, is to cast him out of the church. Now, that sounds really harsh, but there are those within the church who we would do good to tell them to go because they are determined to teach falsehood and to follow after anything but the one true God. If that's the case, they have no business in leadership at the very least. But perhaps, if it's bad enough, they ought to be put out of the church for a time. we got to be real careful with that. I don't advocate putting anyone out of the church except in the most extreme situations. And this one is pretty extreme. So what should John do? Well, John's going to go there. He's going to deal with this man. He's going to put him in his proper place, and he's going to teach the word. That is the calling of God upon our bishops. That is the calling of God upon our pastors. That's the calling of God for everyone who believes that we hold people to the truth. We do it in a very loving way. You know, when we think about excommunication or something of that nature, you know, basically just tossing someone out of the church, we think of it as a harsh act, which it is, and it should be done so seldom. The Methodist Church doesn't exactly do excommunication. They do remove pastors by trial, and they lose their credentials to be a pastor, but they can still attend one of our churches. But there are times when it would be best for the growth of the church and the spiritual development of those around the church that we deal with those who are causing these kinds of problems. So I love that John began with praise and he ends with praise. He's dealt with Gaius, thanking him for all he's done in order to care for those who he sent. Then he deals with Diotrophus, who is teaching falsehood, who is uh, being the bully. Now he deals with Demetrius. Demetrius obviously is someone who John is acquainted with, someone who perhaps is running back and forth between the church that John is writing to and where John is. And he talks about the good testimony from everyone that Demetrius has discovered. And he says then, and I love this, we also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. God loves you. We love you. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Don't give room to diatrophies and any others who would lead you astray. You're doing a good job there. That, that's what this is about. This is about a good testimony, which we all need to have in Jesus Christ. And then he does what he did in 2 John. Uh, I had much to write to you. Don't want to write it pen and ink. I want to be face to face with you. Greet the brothers and sisters around you and greet them by name. Anyone I send, greet them by name. Love them as they are loved by God. Well, that ends our study of 3 John. I hope that it's been helpful to you. I hope that it's taught you a lot. It's kind of strange when you read these little bitty books, you say, what could be in there? But when you really start digging in, you understand why they're in the canon of Scripture. So I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Now, Wednesday, we will start a new study, so be looking for that. Tomorrow, we will have our online prayer service for Saturday. And of course, Sunday is coming, so be ready to be at church 9 a.m. Sunday morning at Sunfield 7785 School Street and at 1030 a.m. at the Greenwood Church, 2638 Park Street Road, Mulkytown, Illinois. Come out and join us in worship. Remember, please take your temperature before you come. Wear a mask when you're coming into the building, when you're greeting one another, and then sit down in your seat, enjoy worship, participate in worship, and experience the presence of God. If you are unwell at this time, or if you have a particular condition that keeps you from coming to church, remember, we will be live on the Sunfield Facebook page and YouTube at 9 a.m., and on the Greenwood United Methodist Church Facebook page and my personal YouTube channel, Pastor Bill Wiggs Jr., the service for Greenwood will appear later in the day. Also, make note, starting next week, we will start appearing on Parlor as well with these devotions, and I'm hoping to also upload Sunday morning worship from the two churches. I hope that those platforms are helpful to you, especially if you cannot be at church. 
If you do not live in our area and you currently do not have a home church, I'm glad that you're joining us in these devotions daily and in our Sunday morning worship. But if there is a local congregation, and if you can be safe to go there for worship, now, I don't want to just be any old congregation, someone who truly believes the Word of God and is filled with the Spirit of God, that's the church you want to go to that teaches the Word rightly. So I want to encourage you, find that local congregation to bless you, and you're welcome to continue to watch our devotions. If you're in our area, come on by and see us, 9 a.m. Sunfield, Sunday morning, 1030 at Greenwood. Well, before we go to the Lord in prayer today, I don't normally mention news items and things of that nature, but this is Friday, October the 2nd, and news came over all of the networks at 1 a.m. this morning that President Trump and his wife Melania Trump have come down with COVID-19. Now, you do not have to like him, you don't have to plan to vote for him, but you do have to pray for him. The scripture tells us to pray for our leaders. If you like him, pray for him. If you don't like him, pray for him all the more. Whatever you do, lift up the, the president and the first lady in your prayers that they will have complete healing along with the members of their staff that are dealing with COVID as well. Continue to remember to pray for our nation and for those running for office that we will be able to think clearly and that we'll be able to make the choice that best represents God's plan for our nation when we get to November. I want to encourage you in that and encourage you to daily lift up our leaders. You want better leaders? Pray for them. That goes for leaders in the public sector, leaders in the political parties and in political office, and for your church leaders as well. You want better leaders? Pray for them to be better. And God might just do a work in their lives so that they may please him and so that you may enjoy their work more. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are always with us and that you teach us. We pray, Lord, that we might not be in a spirit of rebellion as Diotrophes was in our lesson today. But instead, Lord, that we will be turning our whole hearts over to you. Lord, we do pray for our leaders, for our political leaders, our, our president. Lord, we just pray that you would heal him of this COVID-19, that you'd be with his wife, Melania, as well, that you'd be with other White House staffers who may be sick at this time, even some who may not know it. Just bring your healing upon these public servants today. We pray, Lord God, for the leaders in our local areas. We pray, Father, that they will use wisdom in all that they do, and Lord, that they will glorify you. We pray for our bishop and for our superintendent. Lord, give them strength as they lead us. And in all things, Lord, we ask that you'd be glorified. We also want to lift up all those who are sick today, especially those who are having surgery or who are dealing with long-term chronic illness. We pray, Lord, for your healing touch to be poured out on each one of them. For it's all in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, that we pray. Amen. Well, until tomorrow, my brothers and sisters in Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, and may he give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You have a great rest of the day. God is faithful forever. God is strong forever. God